All right, good morning, everybody. How are we doing? Who's excited to be here this morning? In the house of the Lord? <laughs> All right, so before we get started, why don't you go ahead and greet one another? If you're comfortable, you can give someone a handshake or a hug. You can give someone a fist bump if you'd like. that you chose chose us to worship with you this morning.
to fight for me. Oh, and I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will
come sing it over your family. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. My confidence. You've never failed me yet. Ooh. No, you've never failed. trust in you, Father God. We open up our hearts, Lord God, we surrender to you. We surrender to your faithfulness. It's a good place to be in your hands, Father God. It's the best, best place we can be is just to surrender to you, Father. That's what we do right now, Lord. We love you. You can go ahead and have a seat. We're going to continue with our service um, with some prayer time for those, for those names that the people we're inviting to Easter. And so we've been doing this every week, praying over and over for these people. And we, we just believe that the Lord's going to move and he's going to work. So if you would just partner with us one last time. Really stir up your faith as, as you're praying for these people. Remember that this is someone's brother or sister or mother or friend. And to just open up your heart, ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, how can I pray over this name? Let him speak to me. So we just do that right now. Go ahead and take some time. to declare this over, over the people that we're praying for, over this church. Come on, let's get some energy in us. We've got to stir up our faith this morning and just declare who God is and what he's doing in this place. We are not losing our faith in this moment. It is rising. We're saying yes to the Lord and what he's doing. Some may say it's hopeless, but they've never met my God. Some may say it's over, but it was finished on the cross. Some may say it's broken, but the healer's in the room. Some may say it's hopeless, but I know God's about to move. Come on, do you believe that this morning? Sing it again. God's about to move. There's a miracle in the works, and I can feel it. There's revival in the church. Come on, believe it. I believe it. Some may see an ocean. But he's made a highway through. Some may see a mountain, but we've seen a mountain move. Some may see a graveyard, but we've seen his empty tomb. Some may see a battle, but I know there's a miracle in the world. Hey. But I can feel dry bones started shaking all that died will live again oh the miracle you're making the beginning not the end eternity is waiting to see your 
church alive again. Reignite us, reawaken, let the God come breathe again. Like the dry bones started shaking, all that died will live again. Oh, the miracle you're making, the beginning, not the end. Eternity is waiting to see your church alive again. Good morning. I hope you guys enjoyed this worship. It was awesome. Uh, we're so glad that you're here joining us today. Uh, today is uh, Palm Sunday. Uh, today is the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem um, on a donkey. Uh, we're a, a large group of people gathered, and they were shouting, Hosanna, which means God saves, and blessed is the King of Israel. And they were taking off their coats, their, their cloaks, um, and throwing down palm branches on the floor. And a palm branch symbolizes um, triumph, victory, peace, and internal life. So in the first century, um, this is what people would normally do as they would greet a king. Uh, They would welcome him into the city. Uh, They would praise him and then escort him into the city. So the Jewish people were actually welcoming Jesus as their king in the hopes that he would save them um, and liberate them from the Romans. But they missed the real point of the scriptures. The Messiah came to liberate them from much greater oppression. Um, The oppression of the tyranny of evil in their hearts and also the alienation uh, from, uh, the alienation from God uh, because they were apart. But they, they they were in the hopes that Jesus would save them from their current situation. And they're not realizing that Jesus was there to save them from damnation. So I kind of take a step back during communion. And also just to remind you that when the cups are passed, there's going to be two cups, um, the juice on top and the bread on the bottom. So be careful. But I take a step back and reflect. There's times where I'll start taking communion. I reflect and evaluate myself. I start looking at myself. Am I worthy enough? Am I good enough? Did I have a good week um, to partake in, uh, in the Lord's Supper as we take communion? But then I was missing the real point of communion. See, the Lord told us to partake of the Lord's Supper in memory of what he had done for us. That's Luke 22, 19. So I I kept putting the eyes on myself and not putting them back on Jesus for what he did. So as we lead from Palm Sunday, 
into this coming up Friday where he meets in the room with the disciples and has communion all the way up to um, Easter for the resurrection. Look at this week and thank God for what he has done for us. And I'll leave you with this. These central events of the gospel, which begin to unfold on the road into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, did not just change the history of one small nation. They altered forever the destiny of everyone who has ever lived. That is something to celebrate. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we come to you today and we just thank you uh, for this day that we can celebrate, for you riding into um, Jerusalem, Lord, um, weeping for the city um, and just giving us such hope. So Lord, as we take communion, let us just sit in remembrance of what you've done for us and thank you for the blessings that you've given us, Lord. In your name, amen. And as we are about to receive offering and tithes, I just want to um, just pray on them. Um, there's three methods of giving offerings. Um, there's there's by mail out in the bag and I'm in the lobby as well. So I'm going to lift us up in prayer. Dear Lord, I just pray for this offering and tithing. We just thank you for just everything that you have given for it to us, Lord. That we can just give give back that we can just give of our hearts and just um, bless you in these, and the money that you have um, allowed us to have and given to us, Lord, that we just been blessed around this, the culture, around our church, Lord, to other people. So in your name, Lord, amen. Good morning, everyone. Um, I just wanted to say welcome. Thank you for spending your Sunday morning with us. If you are new, I wanna give you an extra special welcome. Um, my name is Jessica. I am the Connections Director here at the church, and I am just so glad to meet you, and I would love to meet you um, face-to-face. I will be over there at Guest Central in the back, um, and I would love to meet you and get to know you. I will also have a little gift card, a little gift certificate for our coffee um, cafe. I'll give you a free coffee if you would like one. Um, there is a blue Connect card in the seat back in front of you. If you would mind filling that out, so that way, once I do meet you, I can remember your name and then get in contact you, with you later during the week just to see how I can help connect you here at the church. Um, I also wanted to tell you guys about yesterday. We had our cleanup at the school yesterday, and it was so great. I want to thank everyone who came out and did it. It was so much fun. We had so much fun connecting. There was a lot of little kids that we got to just kind of hang out with, and we cleaned their campus, and they cleaned our campus. And it was just a great opportunity to get with them and just to be neighbors. And it was just awesome. We had such a great time. Um, so I just want to thank you guys for helping us if you came out yesterday and helped us. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, also, we have our Angels game. Our Angels game next week is the last week to sign up. We are going to the Angels game on April 21st, and it's going to be an awesome time. There are 60 of us going, which is awesome. Just think that's 60 people you get to hang out with, spend baseball with. Even if you don't like baseball, there's going to be someone that you can talk to, because I'm sure out of those 60, there's going to be someone who doesn't like baseball, and you can talk to them through the whole time. So if that's something that's interesting to you, or if you want to invite your friends, that's a good way to bring them to a church event without bringing them into the church building. Go ahead and sign up at Guest Relations, which is that round circle in the lobby. Uh, north of 50, we are having a potluck today. For anyone who is over uh, north of 50, um, they're just a great time. They get together and play games, have food, and fellowship with each other. So if that's something that's interesting to you, they're going to be meeting over in our youth room. Um, and then we have the last one I want to tell you about is Good Friday. We are having Good Friday service here um, on Friday. And it's going to be at, yeah, thank you. It's going to be at 6 o'clock um, here. And it's going to be an extended communion service. We are still going to have communion on Easter. But Good Friday is just going to be an extended communion service. We're going to have worship, some meditation time, and of course, communion. So we want to invite you guys to come to that. Again, it will be 6 o'clock here um, on campus. And I'm going to pray for the service, 
um, to let Pastor Dan come up and, and finish this service out. So if you'd bow your heads with us. Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray, Lord, that you just come in this place, Lord, with your just wonder and just amaze us with what you have to say in your word, Lord. I just ask that you just open our hearts and our minds to um, what you're going to say through Dan, Lord. I just pray for Dan that he can just have the Holy Spirit speak through him and that we are just open and willing to hear and just take it throughout the week and use it um, to, to better our lives and those around us. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jessica. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, I was just thinking about Good Friday and just the idea to be able to take communion in a, in a you know, longer, extended fashion. Me and my wife are just grateful to be at this church and be able to take communion every week and think about you know, starting your week right and just being able to, to remember what Jesus did for you on a weekly basis as we gather together. That's like the best decision that you can make all week. It's like, it's like getting the first question on the test right when you start your week. So Sunday is the first day of the week. You got your communion, you came, you gathered, you worshiped. Then you do the rest of your week. I just feel like that's just the best decision to start. So good job. You came here today. You're ahead of everybody else on your week, and we get started. I I really enjoyed this series where we're talking about invite culture. Because if you're new here, I'm new too. I'm going to keep saying that for at least two years, okay? So that's just kind of what I've been told. But... um, it's a great time to be here because we're, you're kind of on the ground floor of something new, and we're, we're starting, and we sing that song where God's doing something. There's, there's a revival in the church, and we're, try, and we're starting to feel that, and as we worship that, like, me and my wife are talking about, like, it brings tears to our eyes every time we sing that song. It's been kind of the, the anthem since we arrived, and, and the reason we're talking about invite culture is I think it's the number one thing that I would love for us as we go on this shared journey to adopt, to be, some, uh, to be a church that, that God can look at and say, that makes me smile. And I think when he sees us inviting people, when he talks about the Great Commission, he says, go and make disciples. And a lot of people say the go is the part that Jesus is commanding. That's not true. The imperative is on the make disciples. The go is the where. We're supposed to go out And so if we're supposed to go out, we have to invite. And if we're going to invite, we have to be ready for them. So today, I want to talk about our spiritual influence in a way that we have an attitude and a heart for something I think is very near and dear to Jesus' heart. And so you always know something about somebody when you watch what they cheer, when you watch what they show off. You ever seen somebody on social media and you're like, man, every post is about their kids. You know, that's 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 their cherished thing. Or maybe it's their car. Or maybe it's their boat, or maybe it's their pet, or maybe it's the food that they're eating that day. Whatever it is, you can go scrolling through and say, what, what are these posts about? What are, you get to know someone by going through their feed, and you do the lurker thing. We don't like anything. You go through their feed, and you kind of look and see all the different things that they've done throughout their, their post history. You get to know someone by what they show off. And so I want to ask you, what catches your eye? What, 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 do you, what do you notice about people? Or better yet, what do you show off? Think about that. What have you posted lately? What are your last 10 posts about? Um, do, you know, who are, who's in, who are in those posts? What are those posts saying? Are you doing quotes? Whatever those things are, you get to notice what people are showing off. I don't know if you've noticed this, but even the Zoom culture, I get a kick out of what people have behind them in their Zoom box. You know, you see it on the news when they're interviewing someone. Or maybe you're at work and you're, you're seeing all the different things people have behind them. They have pictures of their family. They have nothing. They don't even think about it. Or my favorite are the, the large library of books they just happen to put their computer in front of. It's like, look what everything I read, you know? And it's a, they're showing off, right? They're like, hey, I got a lot of books, and that's okay. And if that's you, that's awesome. But that's what you choose. But think about this. What does Jesus show off? What does Jesus, if he, were to, if he were to go and say, hey, this is something cool. I want you to go look at it. What would he point at? And he does it over and over in the Bible, and I think we miss it. Because it's, it's surprising. There's things all through the Bible that show us what Jesus shows off. And I will make a case today. I think Jesus' heart is for hospitality. I think Jesus' heart is for us having hospitality. Now, the word hospitality um, is found in a couple verses in interesting spots. And this is you know, kind of my first evidence for this. But as Jesus is, is setting up his church 
the, the people that started the church, they wanted to create elders and elder qualifications. And if you look at the elder qualifications, they're very interesting. They list a lot of things. And today there's a lot of debate and arguments over these qualifications. A lot on can you have men or women elders or, or what. And a lot of people really focus on that. This is how I think we miss Jesus' heart. We focus on, on the gender issue. We, we focus on certain things. But if you look at Titus 1, 7, and 8, and 1 Timothy 3, 2, and 3, we see these qualification listings. So it says, For the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, which I think are all important things, not pugnacious, not fond of sordid gain. So those are the nots, right? What's the first do? But hospitable, loving what is good. Sensible, just, devout, and self-controlled. He listed all the things of what not to do, but the first thing he said, but what you should do, is be hospitable. When we have a leader, we want them to be first hospitable. And so you look at the next one, it's just like it. First Timothy, this is Paul writing to Timothy, saying, hey, when you, make it, when you make overseers, when you appoint leaders in the church, make sure they have these qualities. An overseer then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable. Before, notice this, able to teach. Hospitable is before able to teach. Not addicted to wine or pugnacious, but gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money. Those, are all, those all make sense. But hospitable. What does that word mean? We get, it's where we get the word hospital from. So you think of a hospital. What does a hospital do? They care for people. People that are sick. People that are, and, and the thing is, the doctor just doesn't care for the people he knows. They'll care for anyone. They don't care who you are. If you're in there, they took an oath. They're going to do no harm. They're going to fix you as much as they can. And so the idea of a hospital captures this phrase. But the the word hospitable in both of those passages is the Greek word philoxenos. And so we we talked about love a few weeks ago. The word um, philo comes from phileo, which is brotherly love. And then xenos comes from the word for alien or foreigner or outsider or stranger. And so a fi- to have philo xenos, we want your leaders, we want to make sure that you see that they love outsiders, that they care for foreigners, that they're not only looking to protect what's ours, they want to share what's ours. They want to see the church not as a social club that has a bunch of religious virtues, but more as a hospital for people, because we're here to seek and save the lost. We're here, to, the, we're here to be the physicians to the sick. And it doesn't matter who we know, we want them to be hospitable. And so why would Jesus say, I want your leaders to have this quality? More than what gender are they, more than what they teach. Now, those are all important things to consider and all this stuff, and, and they should be able to teach. But we miss the hospitable part. It's very easy to read over it. And I think having a love or a care for strangers is as important as it can be. And you take a look at, you take a look at another verse where it's not just how our leaders are treated or how our leaders treat others. It's also, you take a look at who, who gets to be on the widow list. And, and so in the early church, they had limited resources. So they wanted to help as many people as they could, but they had a list of who they would help. They were people that weren't just signing up for free services. These are people who are actually a part of the church, suffering with the church, serving with the church. And notice this, that a widow in 1 Timothy 5, 9 and 10 says this, a widow is to be put on the list only if she is not less than 60 years old, having been the wife of one man, having a reputation of good works, and if she has brought up children, and if she has shown hospitality to strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, that's two, two kinds of hospitality to outsiders and insiders. So was she hospitable? If she has assisted those in distress, and if she has devoted herself to every good work. So it wasn't just the list of who gets to lead in the church. Hospitality was on the list of who actually got to receive benevolence from the church. I would say that's a very important virtue that Jesus would want. And I think for us, hospitality can look a lot like a lot of different things. And, and for me, I was lucky enough to see it growing up. And, you know, um, hospitality requires something, uh, a different trait. Hospitality is another expression of generosity. And, you know, I lived in a house in Montclair, California, down the hill. And it wasn't the greatest neighborhood, but we had lots of friends and all these things. We didn't have a ton of money, but I'll tell you what. 
I have fond, fond memories of coming home between Hell Week practices at football with all my friends choosing to come to my house. You want to know why? Because of my mom. They knew my mom was going to take care of us. They knew that after the first practice, we'd put all our sweaty stuff in the locker, we'd go home, and then my mom would have enough to drink for everyone. She would have everything that we could eat, and then she would just let us all fall asleep on the couch or float around in the pool or whatever, and we would all you know, wake up and then go and, and put all that sweaty stuff back on and go to practice. But all of them knew that my mom would take care of them far better than their mom, who was probably at work, or didn't, they didn't have anything that they could share. My house was known as a safe place to rest. My house was known as a place where my friends knew that my mom was going to be like their mom. And I showed off my mom. Like, yeah, you guys can come over. It's the more the merrier. My mom and dad, even with our family, when we would, we would go to this park called Carbon Canyon, uh, Carbon Canyon Park, I don't know if you guys know where it is. It's in Chino Hills. And uh, if you're going to go there on a, on a really popular holiday, you have to get there super early to get your spot. And it's very competitive. You have to like stake it in the ground and like give looks to people and be like, no, this is my spot. So there's like certain really good spots that we like. And so we have a big family and they would all want to go to this. We'd do birthdays there. And we had like everybody in my family is like born in August. And so we'd go in August and we'd celebrate um, birthday parties there. But my family, my mom and dad would get up super early to get the spot, start cooking on a gas grill that they would bring and cook for everybody. Like not just anything, they could cook biscuits and gravy and pancakes and, and all this stuff. And everybody show up like at nine o'clock and we're like, Hey, great spot. Also great food. My parents have been there for three hours cooking. And then when they were done with that, they started cooking lunch <laughs> and everybody. And then, and then they packed up and they went home and they were tired. And I watched that my whole life. That was normal. I get married and I want to cook for everybody. My wife's like, what are you doing? We don't have all this money. And I'm like, wow, my parents didn't have all that money. And they did that. And so I grew up in a very generous and hospitable home. And that set me up well. That set me up well because when I understood the church, when I read the Bible, I was like, oh, I know what that looks like. There was never a question of what was ours. There was never a question that we weren't going to share. There was never a question that I couldn't invite people to my house. That was always going to happen. And I want to take this time. My parents are here today. Mom, Dad, thank you for, for putting that in me. And you give honor where honor is due. And I was raised in a good home that understood hospitality and generosity. That's not common. And it wasn't common in the church either. That had to be taught. Why do you think they had to say, hey, your leaders have to have this? Above all, they need to have the attitude of bring them on, we'll take care of them. Because it can get really easy to say, I don't know if we're going to have enough. I don't know if we're going to do this. I don't know if we're going to do that. There's times where Jesus was saying, hey, so what do we got? We're going to feed these people. And they said, well, all we got is this. I don't know if it's enough. What could this do? And Jesus is like, hold my drink. I will take care of these people, <laughs> right? And so when we have what we have, God will use our willing heart more than he will use our resources. When we have what we have, all we have to do is say, no, the doors are open. We're going to make do because we have to make sure that others have what we have. And so it's a get to, not a have to attitude. That's the whole idea of hospitality. It's not a, oh, I don't know, here we go again. It's a, I can't wait for this to happen. When we used to do the park stuff, I couldn't wait for it to happen. And when we come to Sunday, I can't wait for it to happen. We got up here all early because we're worried about the traffic. We sat in IHOP for two hours. I couldn't wait for church to happen. I couldn't wait to see you. I can't wait for what we're going to see next week. We've been praying, I don't know if you know this, we've been praying for over 300 people to attend church next week. Can you imagine this room Full. We added more seats. So you can see some of the empty seats. You're like, I oh, don't know, there's not enough people here. No, no, no. We keep adding seats. We've been, the title of the sermon is Making Room. I feel like I had to make room if we we're going to preach on it. And so here we are. Next week, I can't wait to see what it means to, to, to see God answer some of your prayers. Praying for 300 people. We have 170, 180 people showing up on Sunday. We're praying for so many people to come to know Jesus. But I think we get to see this this idea of hospitality in 1 Peter 4, 8, and 9. He says this, above all, above all, all the things, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. There's a reason why that had to be said. Hospitality is not easy. 
And it takes a heart posture to do this. And, and it's important, but that whole idea of, of, above all, keep fervent in your love. That keep fervent is to love deeply to the point of, it's almost like straining. You have to strain to love like this. You have to get up early. You have to do the things that no one else would do so you can see the things that no one else can see. And so when we say we're going to be hospitable, the reason people aren't hospitable, because it's not easy. So if we're going to be a church that gets close to Jesus' heart, we're going to have to strain to get there. It just doesn't happen. And so unconditional love is what he's talking about there. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. And says, because love covers a multitude of sins. When we love like this, the idea that it covers sins, it means we see past the ugly. It means we see past the dissent. It means we see past the differences. It means when I'm going to invite someone in, it doesn't matter if they agree with me, if they look like me, if they talk like me, if they do the things that I do. No, it's for them too. That's the whole point of stranger. But we live in a culture of stranger danger. It's the complete opposite of this. That's why it's important. But by the way, every human nature thinks that way. So it's all throughout history, including in 2,000 years ago when this was written to today, we have to lean into hospitality because of the stranger danger that's inherent in our, in our makeup. We were just talking about this the other day, or yesterday actually, where there used to be a time where you would have your kids stay over at somebody's house. I don't know if you remember growing up, like you would go spend the night at someone's house and, and all that. Today, that's not a thing. Today, it's like, well, Mike, well, if we have a sleepover, I'll host it. Why? Because you trust your house. It says you don't trust somebody else's house. But you have to open up your home to be able to have your kids have people over. That might even be true within family. So today's a different kind of day where we kind of are suspicious of everyone. But love sees past those things. Now, it's not that we do things to put ourselves in danger, but this does take some risk. And I think for us, it's the idea of what's the priority? Hospitality is priority. Above all, keep fervent. Strain for this. It's harder. So it's harder to love people this way and stay safe. That's why people say, you know what? We'll just not love that way. We'll just stay safe. No, we're going to do both. We want to be a church that, that God sees and wants. But hospitality became very important in times of persecution. We talk about, in, that, in those times, they loved each other so much in Jerusalem that God had to send persecution to get them to get away from each other because they just wouldn't. They, they loved, the church worked so well that God had to send some persecution so they would scatter and go out to all the world. But in that persecution, that's why it's important that a widow had the reputation of taking on people who were in distress because in that time, it wasn't okay to love Jesus. It wasn't okay to be a part of the church. So they had to secretly meet. And so when they secretly met, you had to take a risk to open the door to somebody because you didn't know if they were a spy or not. Talk about practicing hospitality then. You don't know who you're letting in. You had to trust God, that God, wasn't, that God was sending someone to you that he drew to you, not something that maybe the Romans were sending. They had little secrets. They had, that's where we get the fish symbol. One person would draw the, the one side of the fish in the dirt, and they would complete it if they knew. And so that's one way they, they would practice hospitality and stay safe. But would you bring people in? When people are fleeing persecution, are you able to open your doors? Poland right now, great example. People leaving Ukraine, what are they doing? They're, hot, they're practicing hospitality. People in distress leaving their homes. I love seeing an interview by one of the Poland, uh, uh, Poland government officials, and the, an American um, uh, journalist was asking him, so, so how, do, what do you have in place to receive all these refugees? And he goes, and this is early, and I'm sure it's different now. He goes, actually, our people are just taking them to their homes. They're doing a great job. I was like, man, that's really awesome. They don't have to create a refugee center. People just let them come into their homes because they knew that, you know, Poland's been invaded before. There's people that understand and heard those stories. And so when people were fleeing, they opened their homes willingly. That's, what, that's when hospitality became important in the early church. And don't think it doesn't become important today. In Middle Eastern countries, it's illegal to become a Christian. It could cost you everything. And there's people in multiple places. This isn't just one story. There are multiple stories. And I don't know if you've heard about this, but Muslim families, Muslim individuals having dreams about Jesus and him telling them to go to a very specific door and a very specific address. And they know that if they talk about Jesus, they're in trouble. So they have to go knock on a door they don't know. 
And they feel so compelled they do this. And that person has to be willing to open that door to someone they don't know and welcome them into a safe Christian environment. Can you imagine the risk? But they have hospitality in their heart. They're practicing. Why do you think the Great Commission requires it? Because the time of persecution, it becomes very important. You can say, well, well Dan, if, if it gets to that point here, we'll certainly do that. But the Bible teaches when we're faithful in the small things, we're faithful in the big things. If you're not faithful now, you won't be faithful then. And so Christians for the history of the church have used hospitality to make sure that the Great Commission can survive the worst times. It's one of those things. And so what do we have? And so Hebrews 13, 2, it says this, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. I'm like, wow, that sounds pretty crazy. But there's times in the Bible where we read about that actually happening. And so you want to talk about a time where Jesus shows off? There's a moment in the Old Testament where he shows off hospitality. There's a moment in the New Testament we'll talk about too, but there's a moment where he, he talks about uh, Abraham. And, and Jesus, it, 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 a lot of people say it's a, a, an Old Testament um, appearance of Jesus, a pre-incarnate Christ showing up in the story. And so you have Jesus showing up with two angels, and it shows uh, Abraham sitting there on his porch, and it says that he kind of looked up, and he saw these three people coming forward, and he knew who they were immediately. And so he sprung up. And, and what we see is we see Jesus is on his way to judge Sodom and Gomorrah. They're about to destroy it, but they're taking a little side tour to Abraham's house. And it's almost as if Jesus is like, hey, you guys want to see something cool? I want to show you Abraham. I want to show you who, who a person who's actually doing what we're judging Sodom for. We're about to go destroy Sodom, but here's a person that's a great example of what Sodom's missing. And so he shows up on Abraham's doorstep, and Jesus contrasts Abraham's hospitality with Sodom's lack of love. And, and a lot of people think that Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed for sexual deviancy. And that was rampant there, and we'll see that in a second. But there was something far worse that they were dealing with. And, and you see this in Ezekiel 16, 49. And then talk about how it links with God's heart towards hospitality. Why did God destroy Sodom? In Ezekiel 16, 49, it says this, in verse 49 and 50. And, and this isn't in the, in the notes today. But behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her sisters had arrogance, abundant food, and careless ease but she did not help the poor and needy. Isn't that interesting? Thus they were haughty and committed abominations before me, therefore I removed them when I saw it. They had everything they could ever need. In fact, that's why it was such a big city. People were excited. That's why when Lot went to Abraham, Abraham says, hey, we're too big. You, you, go, you pick which way, I'll go the other way. And Lot's like, ooh, Sodom, I'm going over there. Because it had all the trade, it had all the stuff. So Lot lived in Sodom and Abraham went the other direction. But why was God judging them? Behold, this is the guilt that they had arrogance, abundant food, and careless ease, but they did not help the poor and needy. They had no, no hospitality. And we'll see how bad it is. But Jesus contrasts that with what we see in Genesis uh, chapter 18. So in Genesis chapter 18, in verse 3, we get to see what um, Abraham's attitude is. He says, in, in, in verse 3, he says, and, and Abraham said, my Lord, if I now have found favor in your sight, please do not pass your servant by. Please let a little water be brought, brought to wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will bring a piece of bread that you may refresh yourself. After, you make, after that, you may go since you have visited your sermon, servant. And they said, do as you have said. I mean, they're on their way to do something extremely serious. And, and I'm, I'm confident Jesus is saying, look how cool this is. He just, wants to, he just wants to make a meal for us. And they do it. They actually do it. In verse 6, So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, Quickly prepare the three measures of flour, knead it, and make bread cakes. In verse 7 and 8, says, Abraham also ran to the herd and took a tender choice calf and gave it to the servant. Talk about generosity. He took the best that he had because they showed up. And I think if Jesus showed up at your door, you'd do the same thing. But, and, and he hurried and prepared it. He took curds and milk. And the calf and that he had prepared and placed it before them, and he was standing by them under the tree as they ate. He made them a meal. And then they're about to leave. And so they're standing there looking over the valley towards where Lot went in Sodom. And Jesus has this moment. And, 
and they were about to go away, and then Jesus stops them. It says this in verse 16. Then the men rose up from there, the angels and, and Jesus, and looked down towards Sodom, and Abraham was walking with them to send them off. The Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? He says, here he is. He gave us the hospitality. I have plans for him. Should I hide from him what we're about to do? I mean, he's going to see it. You know, if you, if you live anywhere near fireworks, you see the fireworks. This is about to happen. But I'm going to tell him why. And so he says this. The Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Since Abraham will surely become a great and mighty nation, and in him all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Why? Same reason why we want elders and leaders to be hospitable. Abraham was already that way. Why do you think he picked him? For I've chosen him so that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken to him. Verse 20, and the Lord said, the outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great and their sin is exceedingly great. So he tells Abraham, I'm going to destroy the city. And then the, I think the reason Abraham's hospitable is because of his heart for people. We said Philo Zenos. He doesn't know the people in Sodom. He knows Lot, but he doesn't know the people in Sodom. And he's not not talking about Lot because he has this weird argument with the Lord. He says, hey, look, I know what you're about to do, but if there's 50 good people there, would you spare the city? And Jesus is like, yeah, I'll spare the city. And he's like, okay. He goes, well, I know the place. What if we cut it in half? And he keeps reducing it down to five, right? God was showing off Abraham's heart for people. He couldn't stand, like he didn't, he didn't live there. He, did, he chose not to live there. But he was pleading with the Lord about the people. Why do our elders, why do our leaders, why do our widows, why is it important to Jesus that we would have a hospitable heart? Because all of this, all that matters, the whole point of the gospel is people. Not our church services, not our seats, not our house, not our, not our walls, not our parking lot, not any of those things don't matter. They only matter because of the people. The church is not a building. The church is not a property. The church is not a religious organization. The church is the people. And so Abraham cared about the people, and that was important to him. And we see Lot. Lot did the same thing. And so what ends up happening is the angels go down, and they enter into Sodom. And if you don't know the story, Lot sees them and does the same exact thing Abraham said. He goes, hey, you guys shouldn't hang out here. It's not safe. We you ever visit somebody in a bad neighborhood and they're like, hey, yeah, just don't stay outside at night. And he says, don't do that. Come in here. Why? Because what Ezekiel said. They weren't hospitable at all. In fact, um, they were so inhospitable, they were willing to sexually assault the angels. That's what they did. And so Lot was trying to take them away. And he says this, and that's what they intended to do. They didn't actually do it. But in, in Genesis 19, 2 and 3, Lot says to the angels, and he said this, Now behold, my lords, please turn aside in your servant's house. Sound familiar? Sounds a lot like Abraham. In fact, he grew up under Abraham's leadership. And spent the night and washed your feet, and that you may rise early and go on your way. Then he said, however, no, but but the angel said, no, however, we will spend the night in the square. In verse 3, he says, yet he urged them strongly, so they turned aside to him and entered his house, and he prepared a feast for them, and he baked unleavened bread as they ate. With hospitality, he kept them safe. And the people came, and they banged on the door, and they wanted the angels to be sent out to him. And they didn't know what they were. Remember what Hebrews 13 said? Some people have entertained angels and didn't know it. Those people in Sodom didn't know they were angels. But what were they going to do? They weren't hospitable. They were the other way around. It's a whole reason that fire and brimstone fell the next day. And so as we see this, Jesus shows off Abraham, Lot, and he talks about the importance of hospitality and how they get it right and how Sodom didn't. We see this again in Luke chapter 7. This is the New Testament. There's a ton of examples I can give you, but I thought these were good ones. Luke chapter 7, you have a Pharisee, and it was common in those days to invite a teacher to your home, and then everybody could come into your home and listen to the teacher, and that kind of gave you status, right? So the Pharisee invites Jesus over for dinner. Sounds like hospitality, right? But he wasn't really hospitable, and we learn that. He says this in in Luke 7, 36, now, one of the Pharisees was requesting to dine with him, and he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. So in those days, they didn't have chairs, so they had to lay down. And so if you can picture this, there's a table, and your feet would go out this way while you leaned on the table. Does that make sense? And so he's leaning, he's reclining, 
and standing behind him at his feet. So if Jesus is here leaning on the table, there's someone here at his feet. And this is a woman who had come in to hear the teaching. And he said, standing at his feet, wiping or weeping, she began to wet her, um, his feet with her tears. So she's standing over him just broken, crying over his feet. And she kept wiping them with her hair. She, she knew what was going on. It was gross, right? You got tears falling on this guy's feet. And his feet are dirty from walking around. And, and she's wiping them away. And kissing his feet and anointing them with perfume. The Pharisee saw that and judged him and said, if he knew the type of woman she was, he would not let her touch him. And Jesus goes on to say the whole parable, in which we're not going to get into today, of you know, who, who get, who, whoever loves much or whoever is forgiven much loves much. But at the end of that lesson, he was trying to make the point that the Pharisee didn't love very much, and she did. He said this about her. He says, Turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. You had no hospitality. You didn't wash my feet. She did with her tears. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss. It means you didn't even greet me. She has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. For she loved much, but, she was, but he who is forgiven loves little. He's saying, I wish you had more hospitality, Pharisee. I wish you were more like her. But you're sitting there thinking, like, you're glad you're nothing like her. And he's saying, what's the difference? Not the sexual sin, not the prostitution, the hospitality. We miss that in these stories because Jesus cares about it so much. He wants us to do this. In John chapter 13, it's one of the most crucial passages of Scripture you could read because it's Jesus' last words to his best friends, the apostles, before he goes to the cross, 13 through 17. He gets arrested in 18, but he starts 13. We know the story as the, the Last Supper. This is what they talked about at the Last Supper. And he starts the story in verse 1. And, and you know, I know we have you know, Shane and Darren's here today. They're, they're theater people. He had a very visual representation of the lesson he was about to do that day. We talk about elders having to be hospitable. We want leaders. You want your, your, your lead pastor to be hospitable. Jesus is talking to the apostles, and he says, here's leadership lesson number one. Listen to this. He says, he got up from supper, and he laid aside his garments, and taking a towel, he girded himself, and Jesus washed the disciples' feet. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Leadership lesson number one, hospitality. Washing feet is, you know, that's not what we do here because we actually wear shoes. They wore sandals on a dusty road. That's not, that doesn't, you know, translate as much. But it'd be similar to today, um, someone comes in your home and you're offering them something to drink. Uh, maybe give them the Wi-Fi password. I don't know. But whatever it is today, you think about what would someone need when they came into my house. It's a thoughtfulness. When it comes to church, I love the fact that we have people out there greeting. My parents were greeted as they walked up today. It was awesome. I watched it happen. That's how it should be. Greeters, you should never think that your job is not important. You might be the only smile someone receives all week. Think about that. People might come here, and that's the first time they've been smiled at in seven days, since you smiled at them last week. That kind of hospitality prepares a heart for worship, which prepares people to hear from the Holy Spirit, which prepares people to get closer to God. Just a smile. That makes Jesus smile. And I think for us, we miss that sometimes. But Jesus honored the woman at his feet. He honored Abraham. He honors the church. Um, The church of Ephesus is talked about in Revelation when Jesus gives a list of the do's and do nots. Here's what you're good at. Here's what you're not good at. Church of Ephesus Ephesus had great doctrine. It says you get it all right. You don't love people, so I'm going to take away your lampstand and your influence in the world if you don't switch that. Go back to your first love. Love the people first. The whole point of the word is for the people. Hospitality is what makes the Great Commission possible. Because if we go out, we have to receive them. And so next week, we're going to have that opportunity. You guys have been praying for over 300 people. We're going to present the gospel. And and we're going to give an altar call. And if no one comes over and and comes forward, I'll be a fool for Christ. Because we prayed for 300 people. Our hearts were hospitable. 
That's a big important piece. We've planted seeds. I'll be happy with that. If people come forward, we're going to walk with them in their walk with Christ and connect them to the church body so they can in turn be hospitable. A lot of times that kind of reaching will grow a church. And it's not about the numbers. It's about being hospitable. It's about doing church correctly and allowing people. It's simple math. If people come and they stay, we're going to get bigger, right? And, and sometimes people will say, wow, we're getting so big. I can't, I don't know everybody. That's okay. Church was never meant for me to know everyone. Church was meant, always meant, so that everyone would know Jesus. And so when we make a church that's about us knowing everyone, that's a good thing, but there's going to come a time where that's not possible. That's what small group community is for. That's why we break into houses and things like that. But in, in um, 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, the reason why Jesus wants the leaders to have this heart, Paul told the church, be imitators of, Christ, be imitators of me as I imitate Christ. I can tell you, our, our elders, one of the things that attracted us to this church was the fact that they had us in their home the weekend that we visited, and it was amazing hospitality. I don't know if you've ever uh, ate John's cooking. It's, as hosp- you know, it's probably as good as what Abraham made that day. I can tell you that. But our elders have that. We have an opportunity to move forward. We have an opportunity to trickle this down. All I'm saying is let's pay it forward. That's what next week is about with Easter. And I'm going to ask this. I want you to help me out. So we have a limited time where I get to know all of you. There's going to be a time if we do our jobs right, we're going to make room and we're going to reach people that reach people. But I'd love to know your story. And I don't have a house right now. Me and my wife just started looking for homes. Um, so if, if you would like to host me and us, I have a goal of trying to get, as, get into as many people's homes as possible by August. So my email should show up there. Just email me. Invite me over. We will come. I would be happy to. We've already visited a few and I'm like, man, this is so amazing. And I would love to get to know you. I think that's part of what it is. We have a way of of becoming hospitable. We have a a way of becoming the church that God desires. But I got some ideas, and I want to hear from you. I want to hear your story. I want to hear what you want to see. And so, you know, it may take a while, but I would love to to meet you and your family. And if if your house is not available, we can go to dinner somewhere. There's great restaurants around here and all that. And we'd love to get to know all the neighborhoods, too, because... We're house hunting. We will be neighbors someday. But I just would love for you to help me out, to to practice on me, show hospitality to us. Um, But I know next week, we've prayed for a month for people to come. And I can't wait to show this church off to them. I can't wait for people to experience the love and the welcoming that we've experienced. I can't wait for people to get to know Jesus for the first time. Or maybe to wake up from not being in the faith for two years because of COVID. Whatever it is, I know people will be welcome next week. And I hope that you can have this heart of hospitality as we move forward into our week. Let's pray. God, I want to lift up all 300 names that we prayed over for this past month. I pray that you remove all the obstacles that would keep them from from coming to church next week. I pray for those who haven't invited their person yet, that you would give them that window that would make it obvious, that you would prepare those people's hearts to receive that invitation. I pray that people will feel loved and cared for, that they were thought of. And God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just be in this place. I pray that you go out with each one of us into our weeks, that we could see the world through your eyes, that we can be the contrast of hospitality in a world that doesn't trust and is suspicious. And I pray that people would notice. But God, more than ever, I pray that Victor Valley Christian Church would be a church that you would show off, that would make you smile. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, will you stand with us? Let me be filled with kindness and compassion for the one, the ones for whom you love and gave your son for humanity. Increase my love, so help me to love. that erases all the lines and sees the truth. Oh, that when they look in my eyes, they would see you. Even in just a smile, they would feel the Father's love. 
You're wonderful and such a good father. Let all my life, let all my life tell of who you are. And the wonder of your never ending love. Let all my life tell. You're wonderful and such a good father. That you're wonderful and such a good father. So help me to love with open arms like you do. A love that erases all. Thank you for this morning, Lord. Thank you for the reminder, Lord, that we are your vessel. And that we can be that hope for that person. Lord Jesus, help us to represent you well. Father God, when those people, when they come, when you fill our seats, Lord God, I pray that you would do a work in us, that we are able to be hospitable to them. That we're ready for that. We want to be ready for them when they come, Lord. So do a work in our hearts. We love you, we thank you, and we praise you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. You guys have a great week.